Good evening and welcome. This meeting is sponsored by Seniors Defending Women's Health, in case you didn't know. A um, little bit of background. Some weeks ago, some of us over dinner expressed our outrage at some of the legislation going around and some of the comments by legislators which seemed to us beyond the bounds. We met and invited others to join us. We met as seven people, seven women, and we had two issues that we discussed. One was our outrage over this legislation, and the other was our compassion for women in this country, in this state, who need the services, the health care services. So instead of responding with anger, we decided we would inform ourselves and we would be useful. Some of us went to the rally for women's health in Concord, and that was rather eye-opening. There seemed to be, not from our representatives, but from others, a rather callous disregard for the posters and the statements and the presence of women there. It seems to be, as we've thought about it, an appalling determination to destroy the, prog the progress that women have made the last 30 to 40 years. So we decided to have some meetings, and as many of you know, we had a meeting with Planned Parenthood, and we had another informational meeting, and this meeting tonight is the third in the series. Our own representatives are rational, reasonable, easily contacted, but they are in the minority. And so we decided we would call ourselves seniors, not women, not anything else, but seniors defending women's rights and women's health. And we used a verb called defending because it's an active verb. And we have told some legislators that we contacted, we had a little script and it said, we are seniors, we vote, we have time, and we are persistent. <laughs> and we are. So this is a political, but a nonpartisan meeting. We are nonpartisan, so we welcome everyone. And now I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Hilda, most of you know Hilda Sokol. She served six years in our legislature in New Hampshire. So Hilda, take it away. Well, this is, the one who just spoke is Margaret. <laughs> Names escape me. I'm glad I try, I try to remember my own. But um, uh, she's been very uh, instrumental in getting this group started. And it's my pleasure today to introduce our legislators and we're sorry we're missing the one who has been in Hanover longest. She's got some sort of record, but not quite as long a record as our own. Marion Copenhaver was there for 29 terms. 29 years. But Marion really served for 29 terms, and I said, why don't you, why don't you do it another term for a nice round 30? But no, she handed that over to Bernie Ben and to me when we ran after she left. And uh, so, and Bernie, who is sitting there in the, in the middle, has been there for six years. And um, next to... 12 years. Right? 12 years, six, six terms and 12 years. And um, sitting to his left is David Pierce, who has been in the legislature for three, year, uh, for three terms almost finishing his third term. And the baby right now in our legislature here <laughs> is Beatrice Pastor, 
who's been there for two years. Now they're all working in different committees, so they have a really a broad range of, um, of different issues that they are working with, but we have asked them to sort of concentrate on the uh, women's health issues that have been a, what? Yeah, just a minute, I am I'm getting around to that. <laughs> Matthew Hood is a senator he was a representative, I think, for two years, for two terms? One term. One term. And now one term as a, two terms as a senator. I got the numbers mixed. <laughs> uh, I should be a little better prepared. But Matt has, uh, um, has had a very good, uh, I think, session uh, working for us in the Senate. And he unfortunately is not going to run again because he has this big job with the um, health center. And I don't know all he's going to do for the health center, but I know he's got a big job ahead of him. So um, it's, it's possible that one of our representatives will run for his seat uh, in, in November. But let's go on to what they're going to do. We know that there were a lot of issues uh, that they had to be concerned with, and I was hoping they would give you an idea how bills are worked and how um, uh, how they're really trying to work for the benefit of the people of New Hampshire. And since the last, they, they, they really have had a hard session these last two years. It's not been easy being in there and knowing what kind, of, uh, what kind of things they're facing. So I have asked them to talk about a very difficult area, which is preserving women's reproductive rights. And so I'm going to let them they, they can each have a few minutes to speak about their, their own positions on some of the um, uh, bills, but there are about seven bills that they are going to concentrate on, and they'll be willing to talk not just as five minutes for each of the person, but they can, their, their colleagues can, can just chime in when, there's a, when there is a, uh, an item they want to uh, suggest. Bernie Ben's gonna start it off, and I'm very happy to hand this over to our well-qualified uh, staff up there. And as I say, I know Sharon, Sh Sharon, um, and her name, Norton, Norton thank you, uh, uh, was I'm really sorry that she couldn't be here because she's the next, she really has been there for at least 20 years, I think. But anyway, we've got a good session of people, good, Good legislators, and I'm going to let the let them really hold the hold uh, the fort for us. Thank you very much for being here, guys. Thank you, Hilda. Can you uh, hear me? It's all right. The you know Hilda uh, wanted to be sure that what uh, we'd say is would be nonpartisan, uh, which it will be. Uh, but I thought it was important to. Uh, introduce, before we go into the actual bills that we're uh, going to discuss, to actually give you a sense of the context that these bills have come out in the context of the session that we're, uh, that we're dealing with. You know, the election of 2010 was actually, it was a nationalized election that even in New Hampshire, the independent, what we think of independent New Hampshire, this election was nationalized. So many of the things that have happened here are a result of what's happened in the nation and that what you've seen and heard uh, on television, on national news. There was a supermajority of conservative representatives, uh, many of them freshmen, who now rule the legislature and they've introduced an agenda that many of us find troubling, to say the least. Uh, they've passed a budget that follows a starve the beast ideology. You know, that many of us know with this starve the beast ideology was promoted by Grover Norquist for the past 25 years. And of course, the, the beast is the government. Uh, and many new representatives have introduced bills that attempt to change the social fabric of New Hampshire and embody an inexplicable anger toward government and institutions. Many of these legislators act as if they knew and were with the founding fathers and believed to have a profound understanding of constitutional intent. Uh, they give less credence to the over 200 years of statutory law and seek to turn back 
the clock to simpler times before income taxes, regulation, and government programs. Uh, they believe that these, uh, these things have actually eroded their uh, liberty. Now their agenda attempts to recreate what I think is a fictional past, when society was more homogeneous and minorities knew their place, women were happiest if men took care of them, families functioned well with one breadwinner and one housekeeper, uh, when sex was only for procreation and after marriage, uh, when businesses and entrepreneurs were always benevolent. Unfortunately, the legislative agenda that has been offered is inconsistent, often hypocritical, and looks to this fictional past for our future success. Their scenario conveniently forgets that in the real past, workers, both private and public, were generally respected and trusted. Older Americans often lived in extreme poverty and without health care. Extended families struggled and the disabled lived behind closed doors. Our rivers and our air were polluted. We were willing to invest in education, infrastructure, and in our future. We prospered with higher taxes and our economy and middle class grew. We are currently dealing with a broad spectrum of bills affecting workers' rights, education, the environment, gun control, privacy, access to voting, and fiscal issues. However, tonight, as we've said, we were asked to address the numerous bills that turn the clock back on the advances women have made in the last 50 years. As we all know, these bills don't affect only women but they affect society as a whole. Thank you. Again, my name is uh, David Pierce, representing Hanover and uh, Lyme. And it's good to see so many people here. I'm very, very pleased to see the room so full and people interested in these issues. Um, one of the bills, as Bernie was talking about, these are really, I believe, ideologically driven bills. Uh, one of the first ones that I think most people have heard about, uh, not only at the state level, but also at the federal level, is um, defunding essentially Planned Parenthood. Um, if you remember last, I think it was last uh, winter, uh, 2011, I uh, can't remember when it was exactly, but the, uh, the President and the Congress came to an impasse uh, down in Washington over the budget because um, the Congress wanted to defund Planned Parenthood, take away any funds, any federal funds whatsoever to Planned Parenthood, and the President wanted to keep them in there. And the budget almost, uh, the government almost shut down because of that issue. And we had the same thing happen, uh, no government shutdown, but we had the same issue come up before us here in New Hampshire. It was House Bill 228. Uh, prohibiting the Department of Health and Human Services from entering into a contract with Planned Parenthood or any organization that provides abortion services and prohibiting the use of public funds or insurance for abortion services. Now, this bill had a, had a very interesting um, trip through the legislature in the House in that it was introduced, <clears throat> excuse me, back at the beginning of 2011 <clears throat> and the Health and Human Services Committee uh, retained the bill, which means they kept it over the summer uh, to work on it, to study it a little bit more. And then it came back to the House in January of this year. What's interesting about it, though, is that the report from the committee, the committee voted 12 to 5 that the bill should die. The, what we call, we would say, we say inexpedient to legislate, that it shouldn't pass. And um, the, the reasoning was is that uh, federal funds under the federal Hyde Amendment, uh, federal funds and state funds cannot be used for uh, providing abortion services. More to the fact, too, is that Planned Parenthood, I believe only 3% of its services are abortion. 97% of their services are providing uh, critical uh, services for women's health to mostly to low-income women 
And without those services, these women have no access to reproductive health services and to other uh, breast screenings, uh, pap smears, things like that. But again, this is an ideologically driven bill because that, of that, I believe of that 3% um, presence of abortion services with Planned Parenthood, uh, they went after this. So, but it was, again, it was hopeful because the committee came out 12 to 5 saying this bill should not become law. But then, excuse me, um, the, when it got to the House floor, uh, the majority found that they wanted to vote against that. They wanted the bill to pass. And so they voted uh, 150 to 195 the, to vote down the committee's recommendation. And um, the deputy speaker jumped up as soon as that, as soon as that happened uh, and made a motion that the bill ought to pass. Um, there was a floor amendment offered and then um, the, the final bill with amendment passed 207 to 147. So it looked like it was going to go down and then they resurrected it, they amended it and got it through. What's interesting too on this is that the amendment that got the bill passed was co-sponsored um, by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Bill O'Brien from Mount Vernon. Um, and if you've been reading about what's been going on in Concord, he really is driving a lot of the agenda uh, down there. Uh, he's, he's got a super majority, three, three to one super majority. And um, he's, he, his, he, his fingerprints were all over this. If uh, just to be, if we can be a little informal in our approach, one of the things I'd like to just add here is what David points out is something that we're facing continuously uh, in this session. Typically, the work of the legislature is done in committees. The committees spend the time having hearings, reviewing the bills, and uh, coming out with a recommendation to the whole House. Then once a week, the, that recommendation is uh, given on the floor of the House, and the House usually will go along with the committee's recommendation, not this session. This session we've seen an unnumber, uh, unprecedented number of bills which have been overturned, the committee's recommendations overturned, and largely that's because of the uh, leadership in the House and the Speaker decides he didn't like the way the committee went and they have enough votes that they've been able to overturn uh, reasoned uh, considerations of the committees. And this is made this session quite different than other sessions. So even though the committee had come up with that recommendation to kill it, it's passed and now uh, Matt is had, has to take care of it right. now that it's over in the Senate. Next stop. Right. <laughs> yes. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I've spoken to some of you already and said that it can get pretty lonely in Concord these days. So it's very good to be talking to people who are interested in these issues and who want to see something done about them. Um, some people have already spoken about their reaction of outrage on the one hand uh, at the anti-woman legislation and on the other hand about their compassion for women who need these services and if the kind of legislation that has been passed through the House already st stands will not be able to get those services in the state or will do so with great difficulty. Um, they've also commented on the callous disregard for women's health. And I think that this notion of callous disregard is very accurate in uh, conveying the kind of mindset that we deal with at the legislature these days. Um, David has mentioned that uh, one of the things that has happened repeatedly, and, and, and Bernie has confirmed that, is that we see over and over again, we see uh, bills that go to a committee, uh, get voted one way, and then they come to the floor of the House, and sometimes it's, a, it's a one against 16. They will come to the floor of the House, they will pass with a huge margin of votes and the work of the committee will be reversed. And this is, this is more than anecdotal. It's very revealing of the way things are being done in Concord 
at this time. The committees do the work. The committees have the hearings. They listen to the people. They listen to testimony. Based on information, they make a recommendation. When that recommendation gets to the floor of the House, it used to be, it is true that I'm the baby of the group, but only in terms of my years at the legislature. But um, it used to be that the recommendation of the committee would get to the floor and there would be a debate. And in many cases, in most cases, the House would support the committee's recommendation when it was a strong one. It's not happening now. Why? Because between the work that the committees do and the vote on the floor, there is a great deal of pressure exerted and it's exclusively party-based ideological pressure. The speaker will see personally in the caucus to uh, making sure that certain bills that were passed in committee will not pass on the floor of the House. Uh, women's health issues are certainly in that category. Um, workers' rights issues are also in that category. Uh, clean energy, renewable energy, energy efficiency bills are also in that category. So we've seen that happening over and over again. In looking at the house the way it is now, in looking at what's happening to women's health, women's health is just one area where nothing can go through that does not conform to that ideological agenda. And the problem is that we're not talking about an agenda that has been formulating by four or five or 20 or 1,000 people in the state of New Hampshire. We're talking about a national agenda that our representatives, those who are formulating, you know, drafting and sponsoring all those bills, for instance, against women health, are getting from national websites like the American Legislative Exchange. So it's, an, it's a national agenda and for that reason they feel like they're really empowered and they have a mandate to push that through. It's, it's, uh, it, it all comes down whether you look at energy efficiency, clean energy, you know, climate change bills, which is what my committee works on, or whether you talk, you talk about uh, women's health issues and the need to protect and support women and to deal with crucial issues like, for instance, contraception and teenage pregnancies, or whether you're looking at the rights of workers and their ability to negotiate for their uh, for the rights. What you're dealing with is a group of people who practice a kind of, of of Darwinism, you know, a survival of the fittest, and are totally, totally oblivious to any notion of common good. This country was built on the notion of the common good. And what those new representatives are doing is that they're undoing all that progress, you know, that had been made not only in terms of the women, in terms of the women, in terms of the workers, in terms of ill people, in terms of seniors, in terms of the most disadvantaged people in the state. And that's what we're dealing with in Concord at this point. The women's health issues, as I said earlier, are part of that more global vision and that callous disregard for what some of us consider to be not only the founding principles of this society, but what maybe what the most valuable thing that as a society we have come to be able to offer. I'd like to uh, just one other thing on terms of this Planned Parenthood bill. I, mean, I had mentioned that there's hypocrisy going on down there. Uh, and one of the things that we have found is that in terms of budget, move it closer. Uh, in terms of budget, the, they have voted Virtually, there's not, not enough money to pay for programs. There's not, they're not willing to raise any money. Uh, uh, that's fairly clear. But when it comes to a bill such as this Planned Parenthood bill, they are willing to give up almost a million dollars. There's about, I was just looking, there's $515,000 of federal money that we'd be giving up and 410,000 
dollars of uh, general funds money uh, that they're willing to give up uh, in order to implement this uh, uh, this ideological bill. And so that's it's quite hypocritical. And, but you'll see that again on many of these bills. Good evening. Uh, so this said, my name is Matthew Hood. I serve as the senator for District 5, which of course includes Hanover. I live in Plainfield, and I'm clearly also on the short term uh, of the number of sessions I've served. This will be my third, um, and lasts for a little while. Uh, it's not necessarily only because I've taken a job at Dartmouth Hitchcock recently, but I was also married in September. Uh, and for that reason, I'm going to focus my energies elsewhere right now. Um, I'm also delighted to be here because I'm a proud defender of women's health. Uh, now, I come to that by choice, but if any of you knew my mother, Charlotte Hood Quimby, you know that it's not really a choice. <laughs> um, she was a legislator. My, my, my mother is, uh, has been a nurse midwife uh, for her entire career, uh, started the midwifery program at Dartmouth Hitchcock when we came to the area in 1983, um, and served in the legislature. Uh, for two terms. Um, we did not carpool often, uh, unfortunately, though she was in the House when I was in the Senate the first term. Um, and w one of the things that I'd like to do is a little bit elaboration on what Beatrice talked about, which was um, the structure in Concord. So you all, under you all know that there are 400 members of the House of Representatives in New Hampshire. Uh, there are three to one, roughly, odds of Republican to Democrat. You have four Democratic representatives um, who are absolutely defenders of women's health. The, in the Senate, there are 24 senators, and the ratio is there are five Democratic senators and 19 Republican senators. So um, I am, am in the minority, to say the least. Uh, what I, uh, but thank goodness I'm not in the House. It sounds like a horrible place to be right now. Um, and at least in the Senate, it's less ideological. There's still some of that, but it's less ideological. Um, and we're, I think, fairly commonly referred to as the adults in the room. Uh, so what I view my job as personally and the Senate's job as is making bad stuff less bad, and we spend a fair amount of time doing that. So the legislation that your representatives talked about tonight, particularly the issues that we're focusing on women's health, think of it as a funnel. So 400 members of the House pass legislation on to 24 members of the Senate who then try to deal with all of those bills, and we're getting all of those bills now. Um, I can tell you that the committees that I serve on are commerce and judiciary, um, and we get some of the some of the abortion bills, but more in terms of there's one that uh, is looking at the definition of a fetus for the manslaughter and murder charges. So some of these issues will take up um, the Senate's a bit more intimate. So even if a bill isn't heard in your committee, you still have significant influence into how it plays out on the floor of the Senate. Or, um, and I genuinely think we actually do have uh, our most of my colleagues are fairly reasonable and rational, and even if they're on the other side of the aisle. Um, I, we caucus in a broom closet, but even if they're out there in the, um, in the, bigger, space room, in the bigger spacious room, uh, they'll listen to us and we can have reasonable conversations. Um, what are some of the other health care issues that we've been talking about? One of the ones that wasn't mentioned so far is what I consider to be the single biggest health care uh, bill that was dealt with last year, which is the budget. Um, the budget, in my opinion, sets the priorities for the state. It, it says who you are as a state. And in addition to underfund, uh, reducing funding for higher education by 50%, we made dramatic reductions to health care in the state. So whether you're talking about Medicaid reimbursement rates, whether you're talking about completely just stopping reimbursing hospitals for the amount of uncompensated care that they give, um, any of those choices uh, are choices that affect people, women, children, adults, seniors, um, and the choices that are the ideological ones, I think those are, those are statement legislation bills. And, and I, the only thing that I, I don't disagree, I would, I would elaborate on something that Bernie said. It's not, we're not talking about $500,000 or $700,000 with respect to the Planned Parenthood. There's one bill that if the, if the legislature passes it, any institution, any healthcare provider 
uh, can't contract with the state. So what does that mean? Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, would no longer be able to provide Medicaid services for um, the population that they serve. Now, some at Mary Hitchcock might say, that's not bad since we're getting 50 cents on the dollar for Medicaid services we're doing, but we all know that that's a, it's a mission-driven institution and it's part of the healthcare uh, healthcare provider's uh, purpose for being. So these, the state is putting, in my opinion, healthcare providers in serious jeopardy, which is in turn putting those who receive care in serious jeopardy. It's completely unsustainable um, and we'll have to resolve this somehow. That's a bigger conversation than the one we're having tonight perhaps, uh, but one that we should have, which is we never talk about revenue. We never talk about the other side of the ledger. We just talk about cuts and that's never been more so than this session. Um, what else did I want to talk about tonight? Uh, what you can do, maybe I'll go there and then we can open it up to questions because I want to talk about what you want to talk about. Um, your representatives and your senator to date have been um, on board with the issues that are important to you, I think, particularly women's health and defending women's health. What's really important is that, sure, let your legislators know how you feel and that you support their decisions when they vote the right way, but if you have friends in other parts of the state, it's really important to talk to them so that they contact their representatives and their senator. So if, if I leave with nothing else, um, keep that in mind. Talk to five friends that exist, that live in other parts of the state because those are the people who can weigh in with their representatives and senator and, and actually perhaps make a difference with how some of these issues come out. Thank you. No. Thank you. Did, you. did you want to say something else? Bernie? Well, I was just going to suggest yeah. is that we could read, there were seven bills that we thought we'd, we'd uh, talk about, and we could just read the titles of them to you, and you might be able to ask questions if you've heard about the bill or if you'd like to, you know, try the, because we don't want to get too deep in the weeds, as we say, uh, of, of some of these bills. But uh, the besides the uh, uh, Planned Parenthood one, there was a, a bill relative to the Women's Right to Know Act regarding abortion information. And this is what, is, has to, what a woman has to be told before she can have an abortion. And there's a 24-hour delay that's built into this bill. Uh, another bill is an act repealing the Certificate of Need law. I don't know if anyone knows what the Certificate of Need is, but this is a, a board that uh, actually reviews all uh, proposed hospital expansions and medical facility expansions to determine whether or not there's actually a need for such a, uh, a facility or expansion. That's been proposed to be eliminated. Uh, there's another one relative to the destination specialty hospitals. Now that's a bill that is tied to this certificate of need. It's specialty hospitals or some that you've seen advertised on television. They're trying to come into the state and uh, there's a bill that's trying to ease the way for these profit uh, generating hospitals to get into the state by eliminating certain taxes for them and eliminating the need to go through the certificate of need. Uh, another one is uh, uh, relative to the rights of, of uh, medical professions to deny service on because of uh, the, uh, they're, they're, they don't agree with the, uh, uh, I guess what we'd call it, the conscious uh, clause. Uh, that bill happens to have been tabled, so it will not become law unless somebody takes it off the table uh, this term. But it basically would say that a doctor uh, wouldn't have to perform a certain service if he doesn't believe, if it's against his, uh, his conscience. Uh, and there's all sorts of implications for that. Uh, and then there's a bill uh, relative to partial birth abortions which, as I understand, are not done in this state in any case. Uh, and if they are, they're only done in emergency situations to save the life of uh, the mother. Uh, and in fact, it's a misnomer what the, they call it partial birth, uh, but it really isn't. Uh, then the last one was uh, uh, an act recodifying the laws 
relative to religious societies and adding a religious exemption to the insurance mandates relative to coverage for contraception. Basically a law saying that uh, if, a, uh, if there's a, if it, if, uh, a, a policy that's paid for by uh, a, an employer, let's say uh, you know, a religious uh, uh, hospital or religious there, they don't have to include contraception in that policy. Uh, and there's all sorts of implications about that. So those are the ones that we're, we have come at least somewhat prepared to, to talk about. Thank you very much. Aren't we fortunate to have such good legislators representing us in Concord? Yeah. Thank you. Let's take some questions now. If you have some questions, just uh, raise your hand. And if you would like to direct it to a certain legislator or senator, please say that. Do we have a mic for up here in the front, Jenya? I oh, all right. We'll start in the back then. Okay. I just wanted to ask about the personhood amendment. I mean, um, law. Are they the fetal per personhood law? Is that going to be something that you're going to be dealing with? Yeah. That's the the fetal manslaughter. Right. But that's, we will be dealing with that, and it came over to the Did Senate, it so it, it will be heard in the Judiciary Committee coming up in the next month or so. So essentially what, what um, it aims to do, I believe, is to define a fetus as a person for purposes of murder or manslaughter. So there, there has been in New Hampshire, I believe, a case where, uh, or in other parts of the country, where um, someone's driving a car drunk and crashes into a woman who's eight months pregnant and both the mother uh, and the fetus die. Uh, the person, or the mother doesn't die and the fetus dies, uh, expires, uh, and the police uh, can, or the prosecutors can only charge with um, one level of offense, whereas if they could charge for the loss of the fetus, they would charge at a much higher, uh, prosecute at a much higher uh, level. So uh, people argue different things. If, uh, if for example, uh, the conser social conservatives tend to think that it's kind of a foot in the door uh, because as soon as you define a fetus as a person for one purpose, you can define it as a person for other purposes. And so it starts to chip away at some of the uh, uh, freedoms with respect to uh, termination that exist currently beyond um, I don't know if the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court has ruled on those types of, of definitions, but we will take that up in the Senate shortly. Yeah. And I, th I think that may be one of the bills that actually the committee recommended against and got turned over on the floor because I'm kind of uh, shocked that it made it to the Senate. I didn't think it had. <laughs> well, the word, the word of the House, just as someone pointed, pointed uh, earlier, is hopefully the Senate will fix that. Right. That's what we say routinely every time we lose one of those bills on the floor. But this one, this, this personhood bill, because again it's part of a whole network of similar bills that are being uh, uh, drafted uh, um, at the national level. It, it is really a very perverse bill because on the one hand they're presenting it as a, as a bill for the protection of women. They specifically will refer to cases of domestic violence where the, the woman has lost a pregnancy as a result of some uh, physical abuse on the part of one of, you know, the husband or the boyfriend of relatives or whatever. But just as, just as Matthew pointed out, the real goal is to redefine personhood so that uh, the fetus becomes a person from the time of conception. And if you do that, not only do abortions, first-term abortions, go down the drain, but so does contraception. So that's, that's, it's like a roundabout way to, again, chip at women's health under the pretense of being out to protect women's health and to protect women from harm and children from harm. Um, when I was in the legislature, I think for three years, I tried to get 
any bill that talked about a fetus as a person or an unborn child, I tried to get those bills to use the term fetus because just by using the terminology, an unborn child, that, that changes the whole concept of what's happening here. And I'm afraid I started looking at some of the bills now, and as I say, I would go over the bills to make sure that a fetus was the terminology used. And when I got back, when I was no longer in the legislature, and I looked at some of these bills and the wording of unborn child uh, comes back. And that just indicates how the words make such a difference in how one thinks about an issue. And, uh, and they're there right now, they're, they're really getting to the point where they are really, in some cases, concerned more about the fetus than the person, the woman herself. So uh, that's just an addendum to what uh, I find you can, I think we've been trying to get this through for many, many years and it it's, uh, uh, comes up all the time. I'd like to go back to your introductory remarks when you were talking about the structure. And I'm so dismayed to hear about the disparity between a committee's recommendation and then the vote on the floor. So my question is, how do the committees get appointed? And why, therefore, do we have this disparity? Well, the committees, there's, uh, they're laid out in the rule book of the, of the, in the House, and I assume in the Senate also, and they're appointed uh, by the Speaker. He has ultimate uh, say as to who is on what committee. However, uh, it has been generally accepted that the minority, the Speaker is almost always of the majority party, and the uh, minority leader makes recommendations for the minority members on the committee and almost always the speaker goes along with that and uh, so in effect each party chooses its members of the committee and the committees are proportional to the uh, partisan divide in the overall house so if we have one quarter if democrats are one quarter in the House, they'll have one quarter of the members on a committee. Well, uh, here is the case where uh, leadership doesn't have control all the way until the end. Uh, and in some cases, uh, leadership is, uh, we're finding this happening quite, quite often. Uh, if someone on committees, committees are, are autonomous. However, a com uh, the speaker can change a member of the committee anytime he wants. And it has been happening this session that the, uh, someone is going to vote in the, uh, let's say, opposite to what the speaker would like on a particular bill, if the speaker's being attentive to this particular bill, and he can replace that person with someone who will vote the way he wants. So he has that influence and that he's used that quite often. But often the committee is somehow more rational. I think as Beatrice said, you know, they sit, they listen to the public, they listen to testimony, they try to determine the facts. And I think committees try not to be terribly partisan. But somehow when it gets, then their recommendation goes out onto the floor of the House and, you know, as they say, all things uh, break loose at that point, you know, and uh, leadership has more, uh, more say often. I wonder if you will, uh, over here, <laughs> uh, if you would talk a little bit about the implications of the bill to eliminate the certificate of need, which seems to me to be, among other things, an assault on the, on VHMC, if I understand it, and it has other implications too. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm not familiar. Well, uh, this is, is an interesting case, and I'm not sure I'm 100% up to date on what, where the bill is and how it's, uh, 
you know, what's happening. You, uh, you know, what did happen, I know, in the House, the, uh, there was a bill to eliminate the certificate of need. However, in committee, there was sort of a coup, and we did pretty well, where the bill got amended uh, to not eliminate the certificate of need, but to change the co composition of the board. Uh, up to now, the board has been made up of largely people uh, representing the institutions, the hospitals and uh, clinics around the state. And some people felt that that hasn't worked, you know, there's some sort of conflict of interest there and that they, there should be more general uh, representation on those boards. So the, in the House, it was amended to uh, change the composition of the board to lessen the influence of the institutions. And I think it's gone to the uh, Senate, and I don't know where it stands now. That, am I correct in what you're getting from us? <laughs> Do you know? Um, uh, my, actually, my, my recollection is the bill passed as it was introduced, so the amendment that was offered by the committee wasn't accepted. Um, and so that's going to Health and Human Services in the Senate, and it will be heard on August 26th, I believe. Uh, April 26th, sorry, thank you. Um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, hopefully uh, it would be better if it would hurt in August, we'd be right. gone. Um, <laughs> Dartmouth-Hitchcock has weighed in very publicly against this bill, as have other hospitals. I mean, I don't know that it affects just uh, DHMC, but the idea is to say, um, and Elliot Fisher at, uh, with the Dartmouth Atlas project has been, uh, went and testified uh, against it and explained that the issue is you don't want to over supply because healthcare is different. It's people actually rise to meet. The, the demand rises to meet the supply. So if you have oversupply, you're going to have over, over utilization. Um, I don't, that's about as much I've now exhausted my knowledge on that topic other than to say um, you want to make sure that there's a proper balance between um, the available resources and the need for those resources. And doing away with the certificate of need presumably just makes it a market enterprise where uh, anyone can come in and whoever provides the best service will prevail. Um, I think an argument has been made and can be made why healthcare is different uh, in the terms of the market system. You can agree or disagree with that, but that argument has been made. The other bill that uh, Dartmouth has weighed in against is the um, specialty hosp cancer hospital bill, which is um, what I view as nothing but a uh, special interest bill, uh, which is that an entity Cancer Treatment Centers for America has, has said, we want to come into the state, we don't want to pay the Medicaid enhancement tax that all the other healthcare facilities provide, uh, and we don't want to go through the certificate of need process, and then, um, then we'll come in, uh, which, and provide specialty cancer treatment. What is special about this place as compared to Norris Cotton uh, Cancer Center, I'm not sure. No one's answered that question yet, um, nor has anyone answered the question about why it's equitable for one institution, an out-of-state institution, to receive special treatment with respect to rolling out the red carpet. Um, again, I think people, if I'm to be fair, people would say that it's the free market and you should, and to which I'd say, okay, then keep the le playing field level. Um, well, there's no question. There's no question that the certificate of need can be uh, used by a, uh, a committee with its own agenda. So the crucial question then is: You say that it eliminated a number of positions. Who appoints the members of the committee? Who decide? I shouldn't say the committee, but who decide on a certificate of needs? Is that clear? You look puzzled, yeah, I, Bernie. I, I'm not sure I know the answer. Oh, I see. Well, I, think, I, I think what Matthew, <laughs> Matthew was clarified, saying, though, is that, that we, the amendment did not pass, so that it's the original bill with the original makeup of the committee that the Senate is going to hear, if I understand correctly. My, my guess would no. be. My guess would be, and it's a guess, is that the Senate will revisit the amendment that was proposed by the committee uh, and say, let's revise or reform the Certificate of Need Board if, in fact, that's, the, um, that's what needs to happen. The answer to the question of who exactly will appoint them, 
if I recall correctly from reading the bill, but it's been a, the, the amendment, but it's been a while, is a combination of uh, gubernatorial appointments as well as legislative uh, appointments, um, and then disinterested uh, representatives of healthcare consumers uh, and maybe a healthcare provider or two. But uh, there, I, there, there will still be on the board, but not a majority. Uh, what happened to the casino proposal? That was uh, House Bill 593, I think, came up two weeks ago, and it went down. Um, there are, it's not a partisan issue, interestingly. Uh, both caucuses are split on the issue. Um, but what's interesting, what was interesting about this bill is that um, in prior years, there have been uh, Democrats who supported expanded gambling, um, mostly down in um, Nashua and Manchester downstate, um, because the the funds from those, uh, you know, the, the state revenue from those bills would have gone into things like education and other other uses. What was interesting about this bill, though, that even people I know that have supported expanded gambling in the past voted against it is because all of the funds generated from the bill would have gone to cut business taxes. Mm -hmm. So nothing, no, nothing would be funded from expanded gambling. So we'd have a, a casino atmosphere in New Hampshire and um, no tangible benefit from it. But thankfully it went down. And I think you know, gambling is one of those issues that, as David said, is, has been nonpartisan, but it's been quite regional. And so uh, our area up here, I think, I don't think, we, I've had a constituent who tell, told me that they think it's a good idea. I think up here, you know, we're generally uh, against uh, expanded gambling. But you go down to Nashua and Salem uh, on the mass border and they're overwhelmingly for gambling. So, May I ask a question about, first of all, thank you, whoever made the suggestion that we call five people in the state. This room is full of people who've come from all over the country and may perhaps don't have that accessibility. So I would like to ask a suggestion of another suggestion that can be done. This is an active group of people here who have some time on their hands, who could make and are outraged by what is happening and could take action if you make another suggestion. I made a suggestion at, at dinner to the group I was having dinner with, was that to contact the, um, the organizations that are in Concord, whose job it is to monitor these things. If women's health is of particular interest to you, um, and these issues that, you know, some of the bills we've been talking about, I suggested uh, to my table mates as they contact Planned Parenthood. Uh, they have regional, uh, or, you know, field operations. They have lobbyists there in Concord, and they could use the, uh, the manpower. Um, if there are other issues you're interested, interested in, um, you know, senior issues, there's the AARP down there in uh, Concord. Contact them for, uh, for, you know, for legislative work. Um, you can find, of course, just like down in D.C., you can find groups on every side of just about every issue down in Concord. And if you have a um, uh, particular interest, uh, I'd be happy to help you, you know, hook you up to, to whoever you would like to talk to as I'm sure anybody up here would. In addition to what David said, which I think are those are excellent ideas, because I had a, a call uh, asking exactly that same question uh, from one of you, and I uh, don't know. Uh, and uh, uh, the, at, the, at the, the call asked, well, should we call? Should we, uh, or email, or what should we do? We want to do something. And my suggestion was not to send out individual emails to legislators because we get hundreds of stock emails I don't think do a lot of good. My suggestion was to find a bill or some bill that you're interested in uh, 
you can and we have websites. That's the one thing that is quite good. In, uh, in, in we have a, a state website uh, and a general court website where you can find the uh, all bills listed. Uh, you can find the description of the bill. You can find where the bill is going to be heard. Now, as we say, most of them are going into the Senate. So my suggestion was, if you know that you have a bill that, let's say one of these, that you feel strongly about, write a simple one-page uh, opinion on the bill, it could be one paragraph, and get as many signatures as possible onto that, and then send it to the committee chairman who is going to hear the bill and ask them to read it into the record. So it's almost like testifying, but having many signatures has more impact than just a single letter, at least I think, you know, coming. They may not read it at the hearing, but some chairs, chairs would. And I've left with Hilda uh, a list of all the committee chairs, uh, the names of all the committees in the House and the Senate uh, with the committee chair's name and the phone number of that committee. And so she has those lists there. And a good way to have input because when I was speaking earlier and I said that the committee does its work, that's how the committee does its work. Uh, they listen to testimony and all testimony gets printed and circulated so that by the time we are done with the discussion, not only do we know the bill, but we know what the reactions to the bill are. And if we get a document, you know, just a short opinion, it doesn't need to be very long, half a page, and it comes signed by a whole group of people, that carries a lot of weight because it gives people a sense of where people stand. And in the end, for both Republicans and Democrats, it's a kind of informal poll that tells them where they stand in relation to a vote, and people pay attention to that as well. Uh, the next election is a little over six months away. Is there any chance that there will be a change in the composition of the legislative bodies in Concord? We are going to have a new governor, I believe. But uh, do you hear any word about where we're going to go? Are we going to continue like this for another? You belong to. And if you go back, uh, my father was a surgeon, and I learned very early at the age of t 11 years of age when the girl down the street, because she could not help, she was 15 years old, died as a result of using a, uh, a hanger. My father tried to save her, but it didn't happen. And I think we need to spend more time individually with our representatives and with the people that are in the legislature and not necessarily saying who's going to be leading what, but to get bound to the results of women's rights. Not men who make decisions, but women's rights. And I am in the minority here. I was a Republican state senator in Vermont, and I know how the system works. And the most important people who came to me to just make decisions were those who contacted me if I could, if by phone or came to the uh, House of uh, the Senate to make the decisions. And if we, even if we got a busload of people our age to go to conquer someday and uh, be there to say we are for women's rights to make decisions about their bodies and about themselves and not the rights of men to make that decision. Thank you. Um, I think we should wind it up at this point, thanking our representatives and our senator. And I just want to tell you that there will be people circulating and maybe some at the door, one of the seven of us, representing seniors defending women's health. And if you want to sign up, we will keep you in touch with our future action. We, uh, this is not a conclusion, this is part of a beginning. So thank you all for coming, and again, we are very, very fortunate to have such a high quality of representation in Concord. Thank you very much.